everyone. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, I thought I would start by saying, you know, if you haven't minimized because you're waiting for 1255, welcome. <laughs> um, so uh, many of you know me already, but in case you miss me, I am Leanna. Uh, I've been doing a lot of the PD along with Carmelita, uh, John Mason, a uh, number of the computer teachers across the district. Um, but today we thought it was going to be a short week. Uh, we thought that this may be a good time to introduce some some fun activities into the classroom. And now that you've had a, a little bit of experience with the hybrid environment, uh, this might be um, a fun time to introduce this gamification concept if it's new to you, or maybe just look at it a different way um, now that we are in the situation that we're in. So uh, I plan to go over a little bit about what gamification is. Maybe you can think of it, like I said, in a new light, even if you are familiar with the term. And then to close this out, I will give you some resources that you can try, um, some of which are already created and others you can use the template to build your own questions and uh, have some fun with the concepts there. So you should be seeing my slide right now. And if I move right along here, uh, the first thing that's up on the screen is the definition and the concept of gamification. And a lot of you know that I'm in, I've been in grad school pretty much as long as I've been in EHT. So um, I love to pull the literature whenever I can. Um, and uh, I do have some information here about people sometimes have a misconception when they think gamification uh, or gamifying a classroom. They think it automatically means you need to have games. And yes, that, that concept is still a part of what gamification is, but anyone who has a degree in instructional technology uh, will tell you that it's really the creative, take yourself out of the environment of making it a game or making a, um, uh, like using video games all the time, like that's not really what it's about. It's about taking the concepts of what we know to be games and introducing them in unique ways. So the reason why we're bringing this up is many of you have experienced there has been, it's been difficult to have engagement and participation when you have a hybrid environment. Um, a lot of it is just thinking of new strategies of how to get your students logged in and participating in submitting work. So that's why I felt that giving you this kind of concept might help you kind of retrain your brain in that way. Um, and like it says, it, it can be used for games, but really it's a strategy of regular classwork and assignments, and then also putting a point system, a value system, and, and making a, a more competitive uh, environment that makes them want to participate more. Um, there's a, a bunch of studies on this. I, I didn't want to bore you too much with that information, but it is important to know that um, that there, there are some main things. And I will share the slideshow with you at the end of the presentation. Um, but really, it's encouraging students to be active and want to get to the next level in their learning. And I will share that resource with you at the end. But when we talk about how do you actually go about doing this, how do you pers gamify uh, your classroom, it's sort of break breaking down into three main categories. Um, one is how you attack your grading. Uh, I'll talk about the point system idea in just a moment. Uh, badges, something you're already familiar with. The more badges you accumulate, uh, the more tasks you, you complete um, are, are things that you've already seen that you're and many of you being at the elementary level are already familiar with Class Dojo and those sort of concepts. Um, so that would be one way to incorporate that. Um, and then also is using games uh, and are offering points with that. Now within that category, um, I, I'm not, uh, although I am not in the classroom, um, I do understand the environment that you are working inside of. And I know that the hybrid model um, is it takes a lot of work and it is more difficult to keep a balanced level of engagement for your in-person students with your online students. So as I go through some of the examples I have, um, I will sort of categorize them and when I think it may be best to try certain concepts, um, such as when you have the hybrid group that you have an in-person and an online group at the exact same time synchronously. Uh, to, that would be your Tuesday through Friday kind of model. Um, your synchronous online sessions being when you meet on Mondays with your entire class online. And then also your asynchronous self-paced 
um, when you might assign homework, when you might have small groups, um, maybe even when you are in a hybrid environment, you might give your online students a separate task while you are addressing different concepts with your in-person group. Um, so I'll go over all of those as I get to that point. But um, again, if you are interested in what we would call the gamification guide, um, Chris Aviles is a, is a local teacher. He's in South Jersey. Um, he actually wrote up a whole PDF document on how to, how to bring this into your classroom. And um, it talks about different levels and all, all the different components you may not even think of. Uh, he's really outlined step by step and that PDF is also linked in this slideshow as well, should you want to go a little deeper in. Um, but let's talk about the grading concept first. So uh, grading with the additive theory. Um, many of you are already familiar with the, the generalization of how grades work. Uh, this is not to say this is how anyone particularly or, or how um, uh, we as a district or anything like that use grades, but I think you'll follow along with where I'm going here. So um, all of your students start out with an A. Every, you know, brand new marking period. I know you guys are still in, we just finished a marking period and, and you're uh, still in yours, but getting beyond that. Everyone starts out at the beginning of the trimester with all A's and as they do not meet expectations, um, they do not get to certain levels and do not do as well on tests or quizzes or assignments, whatever that might look like for your classroom. Essentially, you have the deduct points from that top tier of being able to meet expectations or master expectations and they sort of work their way down in the traditional grading sense. Um, when you think of the additive model, instead you have everyone start off at zero. So more like the, the meaning expectations and exceeding and everything like that. The idea is that everyone starts at the same level and that they, they have to earn points in order to get the A. So it's, it's backwards grading is how it's explained. Um, so in theory, you don't wanna say that if there's uh, 20 questions on a math, test that, oh, out of the 20, they got two wrong. So they got an 18 out of 20. Instead, you would want to say, hey, you got 18 out of the 20 right. So it's just using different vocabulary um, to make it a, a more complimentary way of expressing how they did on a quiz or on a test. Um, and again, that they want to work toward reaching that A uh, versus the other way around. Um, you can have this with a chart, a physical chart that's left in your classroom, maybe even for your students who are completely virtual. You have up a bulletin board that has everyone's name and uh, the number of points they've reached overall. Um, and you know that it doesn't have to always be academic. It could be they got so many points for logging in every day this week, or they got a, a number of points for answering questions correctly um, while they were in class and the number of times they raised their hand. Um, so you can come up with how to do, incorporate a, a little less academic into it, but still embed the academic components in there. Um, but that would just be, again, this is another way to uh, include that gaming concept, that inspiration of wanting to participate, to do well on those assignments um, by, by offering in that they earn their points instead of losing them when they don't do things correctly. Digital badges, and like I said, you're already familiar with Class Dojo. I'm not, you, you out there know way more about Class Dojo than I do. Um, so I, it was, I'm not even bringing it up other than to say that is, that is an example of how you can use it. Um, but if, you're, if you have older children or uh, it, maybe you're just familiar with it on your own time, um, digital badges are not a new concept. Um, in fact, really, it's more or less just a virtual sticker. <laughs> if you think about it in, in the most basic terms, um, they, they don't necessarily hold any real tangible value. They don't cost any money. Uh, but when you think of the psychology that goes into, if I reach these certain number of goals, I get a badge. Um, that is more likely, again, there's, there's science, there's data, there's research to prove this theory works, not only in children, but for adults too. Um, that once they meet a number of tasks that they earn a badge or a no next level of 
whatever that might look like. Um, if this is something you would like to do, now, of course, if you want to do this in the physical sense, you could do this with stickers, uh, again, on a bulletin board or, or just give the student a sticker. Um, but if you're going to do it with a digital badge and you're into this concept, um, you can make your own badges. Uh, Canva, hopefully this is not the first time you're hearing about Canva. Uh, I love the tool. Um, you can use it to make flyers, brochures, uh, Facebook posts, um, all kinds of stuff. But you also can make your own digital badges inside of here. You would turn them into PNG files, portal and network graphics, not important. Uh, but essentially, you're downloading them as, as photo image files on your computer or on your Chromebook. And then you can assign them or add them to your Google Classroom stream so your student gets notified that they earned a badge. Um, and... Uh, Again, that doesn't have to cost you anything. You can find ones that already exist on the internet, but if you just wanted to add your own little spin on it, um, maybe you can make it something related to the chapters that uh, you're doing in a science or social studies class or um, make it that they, um, uh, for a book that they read, make a special badge just for reading that book or moving on to the next level in, in their Fontes Simpanel, whatever that might look like for you. Um, one thing, though, I would stress if you're going to use digital badges is it's very important that you explain to your students what tasks they need to, to complete in order to get a badge, because that's part of, again, the science and psychology that goes with this, is they essentially need a checklist or a to-do list um, to be able to visually represent what it is that they have accomplished and what they still need to do in order to earn that badge. Um, so this could be something that you write up in a spreadsheet, maybe in your weekly announcement that you send out on Mondays, um, you outline that for the student that if they accomplish all of these tasks, they earn the badge for the week. Uh, you know, you'll know your students in your classroom and your situation. I'm just throwing out some ideas here. But, um, and I don't know about you, but I, I love to make myself checklists. I'm kind of a nerd that way. Uh, so, Granted, I don't put make my bed on my checklist, um, but essentially something that's like an instant gratification of I was able to check that off my list this morning. Um, I, I do that. I psych myself up into thinking that I accomplished something. And, and by having them log in every day, that is a checkbox. That is something that they, they finished for this week and worked toward that badge. Um, so there are some resources on this slide if you would like to get into doing digital badging. Um, and make it your own. Now, this next slide that's up here um, includes a number of different resources and types. And like I mentioned, I will be going over how I believe that you may want to use this in your hybrid classroom versus an online versus uh, small groups. Excuse me. Um, and some of these you're already familiar with and other ones might be new to you. So Jeopardy Labs, if you're not already familiar with it, um, it is, well, Jeopardy is obviously getting more popularity now anyway. Uh, but if you have second, third grade students, um, this might be a, a fun way for them to interact with a game board. Um, if you have used Jeopardy like in PowerPoint back in the day where you had to make all the links work, uh, manually have to do all of that, clicking and, and linking, this takes all that guesswork out of it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hit Jeopardy Labs and share this tab instead. Now, for the purposes of today's presentation, I just picked a fifth grade life sciences game. Um, the questions are already made. Uh, all the points were already assigned. I didn't come up with any of this content. You can go on Jeopardy Labs' website and search for content. Uh, there's everything from trivia and pop culture all the way up to you know high level high school content on here. If you find something doesn't really work for you, um, now like I said, they do have plenty of content on here already, but you can decide to purchase the lifetime subscription to Jeopardy Labs, uh, which is $20 one time and you have it forever and you can make all your own content on here. I see this as something that you would do in your hybrid classroom. Uh, probably divide your students into two teams, your in-person and your online team. 
Um, and then you, you know, uh, I, I worked in kindergarten, so I know they love jobs. Um, you, obviously, I'm thinking again, this is going to be your higher level second, third grade students, maybe. Um, you may want to pick a student who's in charge of keeping track of the points uh, and uh, make that their job or pick one person from each team to have to add the points as they go along. Uh, and, and then you don't have to worry about counting or anything. But I'm just going to click on no teams for just a second here just to walk you through what this looks like. And I'll hit start. And you'd have, okay, in-person team, uh, what, what, what question would you like? And they'd say, life science number five for 200. And you click on 200, and it comes up on full screen. You would read off the question, give them some time to answer. Um, maybe, and if you have the setup as teams, it would go back and forth of which team is answering at what time. When you're ready and you want to give the answer, you hit the space bar and then you would be able to, you know, keep track of those points accordingly. When I hit escape, you'll see that that 200 is now grayed out that it's not clickable anymore. And you would just work through this board. Um, I know that there's like Disney questions uh, like on here. So even if you just want to do this for fun and, and kind of take a break from, from educational con content, you can do that too. But certainly one of the benefits of Jeopardy Labs is that it does have lots of educational content in a number of different uh, categories too. Um, so going back to our list here, Kahoot, I know our computer science teachers are already using this a lot. Um, so you may already be familiar with Kahoot, but the idea with that would be that I think when we think of pre-COVID, like the days before March, um, Kahoot would have been a perfect example of taking all the kids down to the computer lab or breaking out the Chromebooks and um, the teacher would bring up on the screen the interactive, uh, you know, question board. The students would choose a color for what the right answer is or a shape. And, um, you know, that's, that's how it was really designed to be played. Now, I will say, if I share this tab instead, they're not, you know, ignoring the fact that everyone is in COVID and, and a lot of us are online and hybrid and everything like that. Um, so they do have some interactive lessons uh, that you can either do as a small group with a, maybe your online students that you're meeting with in the afternoon. This might be a good time that when all the students do have access to a device, um, you can make this an asynchronous assignment. So that could be something you put in Google Classroom for the students to, to do it on their own pace at their own time. Um, or it could be something you do try with the hybrid students. Uh, I read that some some teachers take the the four colored cards as construction paper. Each student in person has their own set. And as a question comes up, they'll hold up the color of what they think the right answer is and, um, you know, still get that interactive feel. They're still using Kahoot. It's just not getting the full function that they would have if everyone was in a computer lab working together. But that's what Kahoot is. Um, and I don't pretend to be the Kahoot expert, certainly. Um, I know that your computers, computer teachers will know much more and be much more familiar with this content. Um, I, made, I made a joke in the first session that Kelly Wenzel, she's the Kahoot queen. I don't pretend to know as much about Kahoot as Kelly Wenzel. Uh, so if, if you're looking for someone in district, um, certainly there's someone in your building who you can reach out to with more questions on how you can use this product. Um, Khan Academy, uh, now this is really more, I would say in my experience for your middle and high school students, but there is some content that you can bring in from Khan Academy as well. And that specifically is really good for the digital badges idea. So if you want to see that in, in action, um, you might want to make this account even just for yourself to look in there and see how it works. Uh, they have everything from math and, and, and uh, science all the way up to um, computer science, uh, ELA. There is some ELA content in there as well. And thinking again, if you do have older children, um, they do have SAT content on there. They actually have LSAT content on there. So if you're a future budding lawyer uh, and want to get used to that test, they have practice tests and everything with that. Um, and the more that you interact with their content, the more videos you watch, the more questions you answer, 
the more points you earn and also you earn badges throughout your time on their website. So if you want to see what that looks like in, in real life and in action, um, I would recommend you check out Khan Academy. Socrative, I would say, is it's similar to Kahoot. Um, I feel from the interaction I've had with Socrative, that's really better for the one-on-one, -on -one, um, like your synchronous Mondays that you, you might meet. Uh, and then all of your students would either download the app or access the website. And as they answer questions correctly, using the app or website, um, their little rocket ship can go further on the screen. And of course, whichever student gets the, the other side of, of space first uh, would be the winning student. Um, so that might be something you might want to look into uh, for making your own content or using content that's already on there. Um, where in the world is Carmen San Diego is pretty fun. Um, I think for your students, this might be a little higher level. I haven't seen their questions to be um, age appropriate for under third grade at this point. Um, but it does offer that it goes into Google Earth. I will just show you to you for, for the purpose. Ooh, went too fast. Um, for demonstrating it if uh, I use this recording later. Um, but what it is, is if you were, I know when I was in elementary school, I would watch Carmen San, where in the world is Carmen San Diego on TV. Um, so this is a, just a digital version of that where it's tied within uh, Google Earth and it's set up like a video game, sort of. So you begin the chase, you have them read, you click all these things to get started. Um, it tells you how to use the tools and then the questions will appear. And depending on where it says that you might want to look, it gives you a couple of different options. Uh, you can look inside the city um, and you could zoom in and, and say you want to start at the Tower of London and it'll bring you in to the Tower of London and, and zoom you in real time. Um, so you can get the information you need to move on to your next city. Uh, you may find that if you give the wrong answer, um, you give get start getting thrown into other parts of the world that have nothing to do with Carmen and you have to start backpedaling. So if you're familiar with the, the TV show or the game, um, you'll know how this sort of works. Uh, I would say that I think it would be better suited for your older elementary, middle, even high school students. Um, but at least you know it's there. It's pretty cool if you wanna show your students Google Earth and have some fun with that too. Uh, going back to our slides here. Align the Stars um, is, it's an older uh, computer game, um, older in that it's designed only for PowerPoint. And you know, as a Google person, how much that disappoints me, because I really would rather use Google Slides. And trust me, I tried bringing it into Google Slides, it doesn't work. But if you want to have like an interactive Connect Four uh, kind of game or a bingo kind of game for your in-person and your online students in, in real time, um, let me just stop sharing my screen for a second so I can give you my, ooh, I hate saying myself full screen, uh, my entire screen here. And when I present this, so the idea behind it is you would explain the rules to them first. So you'll, you as a teacher would come up with a list of questions or things that you want them to answer in order to get questions correct. It's not something you would embed into the PowerPoint. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's something you would probably have index cards or something that you would keep track of what questions you're asking. Um, and you would divide your students into teams. Obviously the easiest way to do this is to have your in-person group be one team your online group be another team, but you can have up to six teams. So if you want to divide it even further, um, this isn't a breakout room. This is while they're all together in one group, you give each person uh, a chance to answer the question. So, okay, uh, red team, uh, this next question is for you, that kind of thing. So if I hit play, it's not going to do anything. Again, you'll be reading off the questions that you want to ask and the red team would go first. The red team gets it right, they would tell you which star they want to claim. Uh, in this case, they might want to have Q. So the red team wants Q. You'll click it one time for it to turn red. Um, if the yellow team goes next, the yellow team gets it right and they want B. So you would click the star until it turns yellow. And the idea behind it is you would have 
the students try to get three stars in a row, four stars, depending how you're playing the game. Um, and you would want to have them essentially try to connect, you know, three or four. <coughs> Excuse me. So that is a line of stars. Uh, the, the link to it is also in the slideshow. Um, but do remember, it is in PowerPoint. And just like I had to stop presenting my Chrome tab, I did it to share my entire screen. That's how you would have to do it in Google Meet so that your online students can see it. And then also your in-person students could watch it on your projector or smart board or whatever it is you have. Um, if you're interested in making your own games, starting with a template, so you're not really reinventing the wheel and how it, how it connects and how it operates, but maybe coming up with your own questions, Slides Go and Slides Mania are two websites that have templates already created. So if I show you Slides Go, um, you'll see that some of them already have questions already made, or there are at least interactive templates that you can get started with, type in your own questions, and then it will link accordingly. So I was showing earlier, um, who wants to be a millionaire? I think that's pretty fun. So you would click on it, and you can use it either as a Google slide or as PowerPoint, whichever one you're more comfortable with. And it explains how you would edit the template. Um, and then just like you would do who wants to be a millionaire, maybe you choose one student um, to represent the class and ask them the questions. And maybe they phone a friend when they, you know, ask someone else in the class to, to help them out with an answer or however you see that playing out for your students. Um, there are plenty of different templates already on here. I'm just showing you one, but you can see that um, they have arcade games, they have trivia, uh, they have escape rooms, uh, a number of different things. And Slides Go and Slides Mania are kind of the same in that they both offer um, similar content, but they're going to be different designs. So between the both of them, you may want to check them out and see which ones you like for your classroom. Uh, so finally, as we wrap up here, um, I do have the link listed on the screen. If you would like to take a look at the slideshow and access some of the links I just mentioned, um, the website is https colon slash slash tinyurl.com slash eht gamify. Um, I, I will leave it on the screen, so if you just heard me and need to maximize it to write it down again, certainly you can do that. Um, but I also would like to open it up that if anyone, uh, after seeing the slideshow, has any additional uh, websites to share with the group, um, I mentioned to the earlier sessions as well, if I get any emails from anyone, I will also add them to the slideshow as additional links and resources. So if you find something or you know of something that works really well for your classroom and you'd like to share with the rest of the EHT community, uh, I hope you'll send an email out so that um, other people can also uh, use it and um, enjoy it. Um, but that is essentially what I was hoping to go over today. I hope that you... Um, uh, enjoyed uh, and found something new or interesting that you can use in your classroom. And I most certainly wish you a happy Thanksgiving, have a well-deserved break, and I will see all the rest of you online soon. Have a great week, everyone.